I'm your host for this session. My name is George Ann Loss, and I'm the Senior Director of Sustainability at Dallas College. A couple of years ago, I read an article in the Dallas Morning News titled, For Those of Us Longing for the Return of Civil Discourse, This SMU Professor Can Help. I was so intrigued by the article that I reached out to its subject, Dr. Jill De Temple, who is a professor in SMU's Religious Studies Department, as well as the chair of the Religious Studies Department. Dr. De Temple explained to me how she uses the framework called Re Reflective Structured Dialogues in her classroom and on campus. She also introduced me to her work with Essential Partners, a nonprofit organization in the Northeast. Essential Partners was founded in 1989. Its goal is to equip people to live and work better together in community by building trust and understanding across differences. That sounded like something that would benefit our community tremendously. So Dallas College is now working with Essential Partners and two of its outstanding associates to bring these concepts to Dallas College for our students and employees. In our organization, sustainability is included under the Office of Social Responsibility and Inclusion. So it makes sense for us to collaborate with the diversity, equity, and inclusion area to teach our students and employees how to address difficult or polarized subjects in a respectful and productive way. Doing that will have a positive effect on all three areas of sustainability, equity, the economy, and the environment. If you too are intrigued by the framework that Dr. De Temple uses in her classes and in her work with essential partners, please join us for the last session of the day, the one right after this one, which is called Experience Reflective Structured Dialogue. It's at four o'clock. In that session, trained facilitators will guide small groups of people through the Reflective Structured Dialogues process designed to help you contemplate and synthesize the new ideas you have learned in this conference. And so Dr. De Temple is actually working at Essential Partners in Boston this week. So we have a pre-recorded session that she did for us in August. So Sean, if you'll start the recording, we'll get going. Thank you. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for clicking on this link and joining me um, in whatever capacity you are and wherever you are. My name is Jill De Temple. I'm professor and chair of religious studies at Southern Methodist University. And it is my great delight today to introduce to you ways of using dialogue um, in a lot of different contexts. This comes from programs we've been rolling out at Dallas College, but there were hope that you could also implement wherever you are to use dialogue in ways that will bring your communities together across difference instead of letting it you know, perhaps pull you apart. So what we'll be doing today, and I'll start sharing my screen in a minute, is to be talking about principles of dialogue, where it can fit on various campuses, and then how you can take it from your campus into the communities of which you are a part. So let me start sharing a screen. So the title of this presentation is Transforming Conflict Campuses and Communities with Reflective Structured Dialogue. I wanna get you oriented to this in a specific way. Um, there are folks who talk about educators as first responders. So what happens in the broader world comes to us in our classrooms, our hallways, our offices, our conference rooms. But unlike first responders, we haven't necessarily been told or given the tools to respond to that. So again, all of the things that have been happening, maybe it's George Floyd and racial tensions and protests, maybe it's COVID, maybe it's Me Too issues or critical race theory, maybe it's discussions about guns. All of those things that are happening on the news and in our, amongst our political leaders in the streets, those come to the places in which we work. And we are asked to respond because those are the things that are knocking our students and our colleagues and our friends and even our families a little off balance. But you might have noticed in your training as leaders in higher education that you've never been given the tools or probably haven't been given the tools or specific tools to use to respond to this or to understand why we're responding or how. So especially in these times when there's a lot happening, 
dialogue for me anyway has been a way of responding to this and to give that response a purpose and to have a method for doing so. So that's what I'll be talking about today. And when I'm talking about dialogue, those are the kinds of things I'm talking about in this context. So let me back up a little bit. Um, my work in higher education, I am a professor of religious studies at Southern Methodist University in Dallas. But I got hooked up to this stuff because I was listening to a friend of mine who works at Essential Partners that is a nonprofit and the work he was doing in conflict transformation and the way that Essential Partners uses dialogue. And I wanna be really clear about what we mean by dialogue and how then we can use some of those principles that they've developed at Essential Partners to make our campuses and our communities more cohesive, uh, places that have better relationships. So when Essential Partners talks about dialogue, they're talking about a dialogue, a conversation between people that isn't geared at consensus. This isn't a conversation that's meant to persuade somebody. Instead, it's a conversation that's geared at mutual understanding, improved communication, and coming back into a relationship with somebody with whom you might disagree in this curious, respectful, and trustful way. So let me give you a little background about Essential Partners uh, and about why they decided to pursue dialogue this way, because I think it's really important and would help explain some of the things I'll be talking about as we go. Essential Partners was founded in 1989 by a group of family therapists in Cambridge, Massachusetts. What they were noticing in Cambridge at the time, uh, especially because of an event you, some of you might remember, there were some uh, abortion clinic shootings in 1989. They were watching the public discourse degrade over those uh, incidents. People were talking over each other. They weren't listening to each other. Things were really escalated and tense. Those are the same dynamics they were noticing in dysfunctional family relationships. And so they decided to utilize some of those skills, not just in the sort of intimate spaces of families, but they wondered what would happen if they used some of those skills in those more public discourses. So they invited folks from all sides, as many sides as they could find of those abortion issues into actually secret conversations where they rolled out what would become the methodology um, I'll be talking to you about today. Um, and even more than method, it's an approach. Right? Ways that we can build trust in the room, that we can humanize each other through really intentional listening and speaking that's geared at understanding as opposed to persuading. Which is to say, and this is the bottom part of the slide, this is an approach that's really geared towards the process of speaking and listening, much more so than the outcome. You might think of it as a foundation. We're working on humanizing each other and giving people the skills they need to approach each other with curiosity and trust so that those differences that could tear us apart might actually be the foundation where we can build something stronger. But again, it's really important to note that unlike some other dialogue systems that are out there that you may have heard of or even participated in, which are great for what they do, this one is not about consensus. In those initial abortion dialogues that they had, people did not walk away agreeing. They, they did walk away with a sense that they might even share some values and ideas with folks on the other side. And that the other people were actually up to trying to support the communities in their own way. So while they might disagree on the issue, they could agree about the fact they wanted to support their communities and each other. It's a really important thing uh, for folks to understand. So let me talk about sort of the uh, components of this that are important. The first part of what Essential Partners has developed, which is called Reflective Structured Dialogue, is an emphasis on preparation for the conversation we'll be having. Dialogue in this way um, isn't something that just happens. Uh, it's something we prepare for. And we do that in a lot of different ways. Um, some of it is some connection with the community we're in. What's important to people and what do they want to talk about? Where are places we should avoid trigger language so people don't just have those stuck conversations? And I'll talk about the stuck conversations in a minute. Where should we meet so that one group or one side doesn't feel that they have more power than the other or somebody feels disempowered in the conversation? And I could go on about that, but the point is there's a lot of preparation for this. This is an approach uh, that talks about really knowing where you're at and where you want to go. Second element of the approach is reflection. We ask people to reflect 
on people, their own perspective. And we give you time to do that. So instead of going to those talking points, which is probably what you think, how did you get to that place? Let me give you some time to think about how it is you came to believe about what you believe. Maybe it's about guns or abortion or something else. Let me give you two minutes to think and then you can speak. Oftentimes the first thing we say isn't the best thing we're going to say. And the more time I can give you to reflect, the better you're going to express yourself. And also because you've had time to reflect, the more you'll be able to hear somebody else. So one thing you might notice as we're working together or as you're watching somebody else do this is they'll give you a couple of minutes to think. And that reflective piece is really important. A third component of this is shared purposes and agreement that will guide our conversation. These dialogues have a purpose. We're talking for a reason. We're listening for a reason. And we're always very careful to state that reason. We don't want to take up your time for something if you don't know what you're doing. We also hold the space and that purpose with a mutual set of agreements. And these are really carefully crafted for the communities and spaces we're in. It could be we all agree that we're not going to interrupt. We're going to agree to share airspace. We always allow people to pass or pass for now if they're not ready to share so they can attain, retain some autonomy in that conversation. These are really important for crafting a container where people feel they can be brave enough to share what's important for them. We also ask new questions that elicit fresh information, and they're really geared towards stories and values and complexities. So a dialogue about guns, for example, won't start with what do you think about gun control in the United States? That's not a complex question. And again, it's one that's probably gonna back you into whatever side you think you're on on that issue. Instead, we're gonna ask you about a story from your own experience that will have led to the values you have around guns in the United States. And those stories might include growing up, shooting tin cans on your farm. Maybe it involves a war story if you're from a place that's been in conflict, because that will, of course, affect the way you think about those things. Then we're gonna ask you to dig deeper. Now that you've told me a story, what are the values under that story? What's at the heart of the matter for you? Because that's when we start to learn more about who you are as a person, how you think about it, and that will start to complexify what's happening in the room for people. And that leads to our last question, which asks about those complexities. Where might you feel pulled, even if you feel pretty strongly about an issue, about immigration, about abortion, about masking? Most folks are actually complex in their thinking. I think it's this way most of the time, but I could also see the other side when this other thing happens or in this other situation. Those complexities are where the richness of our humanity come out, and that's what this is geared towards. Those complexities are where I get curious about you. I want to know more. And that's where those relationships build up, and that's what this is structured to do. And indeed, especially in these full dialogues um, that we set up for folks, these are structured exchanges. And I'll talk more about what they're designed to prevent and what they're designed to promote. But just basically, when we have a full dialogue, we give people timed amounts of time. If I put an actual phone timer on you, I'll give you two minutes uh, and ask you to think quietly. And then you'll have two minutes to speak and no one will interrupt you during those two minutes. That allows you to speak without the fear of interruption and it allows other people to listen closely to the story that you're telling. It enhances thoughtful speaking and listening and takes some of the anxiety out of the exchange because you're not worried about coming up with that counter argument to what somebody is saying. It allows you to get thoughtful. It allows you to hear where somebody is coming from, which for me has been one of the magical things as I've been doing this on campuses, both my own with my own students and teaching about this all over the place. That moment where you realize you can genuinely share your story and where you'll genuinely be heard. And somebody might just get curious about something you said. Why do we need this? Because our brains aren't as smart as we want them to be. Would our brains only um, be able to tell the difference between somebody coming after us with a baseball bat or something and somebody saying that thing that just makes us want to react and not being our best selves? So let me talk to you a little bit about that. Uh, and I'd like to do it this way. If you could take two minutes, just wherever you're at watching this, and I'll just walk you through it now. I won't 
pause for two minutes, but at some point at your convenience. And think about a time someone said something that went against a deeply held belief or worldview that you hold. And this will work better if this is someone you'd like to be in relationship with, you know, not just somebody yelling something randomly on the street that sort of ticked you off, but somebody you know, uh, and somebody you'll talk to again. So they perhaps said something political or said something that just rubbed you really the wrong way. When we do this with folks um, in a workshop, I will never ask you to repeat this thing. That's your story to keep. I don't want to hear the story. What I'm interested in is how you reacted. What happened in your body in that moment? What did you do? When we ask folks this, um, people talk about wanting just to hit back. Some folks freeze, their body goes numb. Other folks really just want to get out of there and make excuses and do so, they run away. Right, so that's that fight, fight, flee, freeze response you may have heard of. And if you really think about what happens in your body, right, probably your stomach dropped, your heart might start racing. I go really red in the face. Other folks shrink down, they try to make themselves really small in the room. Other folks get really big because they're getting ready to fight. What's happening there? is your older part of your brain, that part that was developed long ago for survival, flooding your brain with chemicals that are getting you ready to fight or flee or just freeze in place so whatever predator it is doesn't see you. You can't control this reaction. Those chemicals happen really quickly. It takes a fifth of a second or so for most people to flood their brains with this stuff, but we don't get out of that fight or flight stage quickly. For most of us, it takes 20 minutes to not be triggered in this way. And here's the thing, when your brain is flooded with those chemicals, you can't really think. We lose access to the front part of our brain. So all of this is happening in the older part, which is the back part of your brain, the first part that developed. The part that controls our rational thinking, our speech functions, that's in the front of the brain and we don't have full access. We lose our sense of judgment because our heart's racing. We're having a hard time breathing. We're gonna just punch somebody out or run away. And while that's a really helpful reaction, maybe in a bar fight or something, it's not helpful when we're trying to build a relationship with somebody else. We're not trying to understand them. We can't even understand ourselves. And again, once we're in that state, it takes at least 20 minutes to sort of move back into full control of our capacities for most people. So if this isn't great news uh, for getting along with folks on the other side of some political divide or another, um, let me talk to you a little more, not only about what this does for personal relationships, but what this is doing to us nationally. Because we are, as I said, in this moment, and all of this is coming to us on our campuses and we're expected to respond to it. So this is some data and the Pew Research Center put together. And this is their visualization of where we were politically in 1994. So you'll see on the right side of your screen, there's sort of the red blob over there. Uh, those are folks who are consistently conservative in their views. On the left side, roughly equal folks who are consistently liberal. And that purple mountain in the middle is where people were actually kind of coming together over important national issues, things like abortion, immigration, guns, what have you, the economy. Um, so it's almost evenly distributed and there's a significant common ground in the middle. So remember that was 1994. This is 2014. We have started to polarize. This is what polarization looks like. You'll notice that folks are more likely to be on those far ends, both on the liberal and the conservative side. And we're starting to create a valley in the middle. There's still in 2014, actually a decent amount of common ground. It's not quite as high as those sides on the other side, but it's there. By 2017, we look like this as a country. We have pulled apart and there's very little ground in the middle. Just walking around, talking to folks, you may feel as if nobody is on the same side as you. 
And it's actually worse than this. So you're seeing that we're losing the common ground, that people are pulling to those far sides and actually retrenching in those sides. By 2018, not only were folks looking like this, they were more likely to say that not only do I disagree with somebody on the other side, that person is trying to harm the country. They are a threat. And that's the state of polarization we're in. And here's what this looks like in terms of social relationships. This is something that essential partners and their practitioners call the cycle of defensive response. And this goes back to what I was talking about with your brain just a couple of slides ago. When we get triggered, we're in that fight or flight or freeze mode, we focus on the threat. We get vigilant for that threat, right? There's a good reason for this. If there's a threat in the room, you know, somebody is coming at me with a baseball bat on one side, I don't want to be really interested in the wedding proposal or something happening on the other side. I need to focus on the threat because that's survival. But we start to get really vigilant for the threat. We look for it even if it doesn't exist. We get really ready to attack or defend against that threat. We're ready for the fight. We're gonna come back with our own talking points. Somebody on the other side of an issue starts raising the issue. We just come right back to tell them they're wrong and give all the reasons that we're right. Well, that then triggers that other person. They get vigilant and they start attacking and defending, it re-triggers us, and we go around and around and around. You've all seen this. If you've watched any, watched any sort of newsy talk show where they've got both sides of an issue, this is exactly what you're seeing. What this is not doing is building relationships because when we're in this mode, when we're so vigilant for that attack, we are only focused on that point of attack. And we reduce people in their identities to that piece of their identity that we find to be threatening. So that neighbor that brought you coffee the other day who helped raise your kids because their kids were playing with your kids and you were always taking them back and forth to school, who maybe cleans up your green belt all the time, is just Lisa the Democrat if you're the Republican who's feeling attacked at that moment, or vice versa. That same neighbor who walked your dog when you were sick, who grows amazing flowers, who plays the cello in her synagogue, is just Leo the Democrat. And you can't see any other complexity or beauty in that person. And you don't wanna be around them because they're threatening to you and you pull back. So what we're trying to do with dialogue is interrupt this cycle. Where can we intervene so that we don't just keep triggering and getting vigilant and attacking and defending and triggering and getting vigilant and attacking and defending? We want to move to something more like this. Somebody says something, they say the thing, go back to that story you know, where somebody said the thing and your body was doing all the things bodies do. What if instead we could take a breath, lean into our best selves and ask an open and honest question? Wow, I didn't know you thought that. Can you tell me a story from your own experience that would help me understand why did you believe what you believe about the thing? I'm not gonna lie, this takes a lot, right? Because you're overcoming your own triggered state. But if you can do this, then you might be able to listen to what they have to say. And not just listen to the story, but start listening for the meaning and values and emotions under that story. What is it telling you about who they are as a person? Maybe we share some of the values even if we disagree about the policy. A lot of what we do in this work also is work on listening. How could I listen to a story in a way that would listen for those values, that would listen for those emotions? And then how could I assume good intentions? Something we talk a lot about is what we call the gap between intention and impact. It could be that you had good intentions, but it landed and impacted me in a bad way. But instead of just fighting back, maybe I ask you about your intentions and realize actually you weren't out to get me. The other thing we'll ask people to do and something that can disrupt those cycles is to reflect. Okay, I've heard the thing, maybe I'm still just a little bit on guard, but what if I could take that breath? What if I could slow down and prepare myself for a conversation that is genuinely difficult? but I can get some perspective to realize the world might not be ending if I have the conversation. Because then I'll be able to respond. And I'll be able to do a couple of things I'll keep talking to you about as we go today. 
I'll be able to speak to be understood as opposed to persuade. I might share my own hopes and concerns that you could recognize that you might share. And I can remind myself to speak from personal experience instead of from those talking points. This is the very basic foundation on which we can build the relationships that will support us as we move through those difficult issues. And this is what we're teaching folks um, when we work on some dialogue skills that maybe start on campus or start in your communities. And then we can start to make a culture amongst us. So again, so our differences can be strengthening as opposed to tearing us apart. So what does this look like? I'm gonna transition now to some research that we did because we had this question, what would happen if we equipped faculty to be for those first responders on campus? And I wanna tell a really quick story about this because I think it'll help you understand both the slide you're looking at and how I got into this work and what we've been trying to do with this work across campuses um, all over the country. Um, one of the current co-executive directors of Essential Partners, his name is John Sarouk, he's an old friend of mine, and he came to Dallas working on this actually with secondary students in a high school. And I was listening to him talk about sort of the co-curricular stuff they were doing. He, they weren't really directly in classrooms in this case, they were working with student life. But I realized that as somebody who teaches religion, I teach controversial issues, no one had ever taught me how to work on the problem of difference in my classroom. And I was just continuing to train graduate students who were gonna go out and do this again without giving them the skills, those first responder skills. And so we started thinking together, what would a classroom look like that incorporated all of this? What would a whole campus look like if we could make a dialogic culture a campus culture? And so we started to work together and we developed some workshops um, and then we got some grant money to actually see if we could measure such a thing. Um, the Templeton Foundation through the University of Connecticut Humanities Institute gave us some funding um, and we got together with a bunch of faculty from different disciplines. And we started thinking about this, um, building on the student life work we'd already been doing or they'd been doing. And we trained a bunch of faculty from lots of different institutions, again, in all kinds of discipline. Um, the guiding faculty on the project were in STEM cell science, sociology, social work, philosophy, and religious studies. And we trained faculty into something we call a dialogic classroom, where they were using these approaches in the classroom. And then we surveyed their students. So what you're seeing here is a histogram, you know, a diagram of some of the research that we did. We asked students who had been in a dialogic classroom a bunch of questions. First, we had them describe a dialogue, and then we had them sort of rate different attitudes and perspectives like this. So the question here was, the opportunity to dialogue in this classroom helped me feel a sense of belonging in this class. You might notice this is really skewed towards the agree or strongly agree side. I think the final number on this was something like 96% of students who had been in dialogic classrooms either agreed or strongly agreed that they felt like they belonged in class. So what does this mean? It means they weren't focused on threat. Because they felt that they could speak to be understood and they were listening to understand and they knew that somebody would be listening to them genuinely, they could be themselves in these classrooms. They were making friends. They felt like they belonged. And I'm not gonna go through, we have a bunch of other slides like this. I won't go through them today but it meant that they were learning better and they were talking about learning better in the classroom. They thought they learned content better. They were doing readings better. Um, they understood lectures better. Just because I think they were actually relaxed. Um, something else I'll tell you anecdotally is I do a go around at the end of my class and I ask students about something they're taking away and something they're leaving behind. Students were talking about taking away friendships. Somebody else observing my class noticed that they weren't on their phones at the beginning of class, they were actually talking to each other. And then they were leaving behind things like bias. They were leaving behind a fear of talking about who they were. And this was making them better students. And I'll tell some stories later about how they were taking this into other places in their lives as well. So how do we do this? How do we get students, um, and as we're talking about dialogic campuses, um, we're also starting to get some evidence that this is happening, not just in classrooms, but in conference rooms um, and in other places where we work together, not just faculty student or administrator student, but amongst ourselves. 
how is it we can deploy some of these techniques from dialogue so that we have better faculty meetings? So that we can really understand what's important to us and make better decisions so that we're not torn apart by these differences. Here's some elements we've identified. A good dialogic campus or one that's functioning is structured for purpose. And I'll talk more about this as we go, but we're using this notion that we have better conversations if we know why we're having them. And we do things like give people equal time to speak and listen. Those go better and can bring us together so we work together better. We've also learned that things go better if we voice our values. Values like curiosity, like listening, like cooperation. If we have those as sort of corporate values, both in the classroom and then maybe in those other more administrative spaces, people will start to lean into those values and will want to actually emulate them. This is what we've noticed with students. They want to be open-minded and curious. Uh, if we tell them that those are the values you know, that we want to have as an institution or in the classroom. We have these co-created rules of the road. When I was talking about the structure of dialogue, this is the container that will hold it. And I'll talk more specifically about these, but these are those agreements where we have not to interrupt each other, where we can pass or pass for now, where we will keep confidentiality, that kind of thing, so that people feel able to speak what's important to them. We make space for reflection. This is honestly one of my favorites. I think it has just changed a lot of the ways I do things. Um, one of the principles at Essential Partners is connection before content. We make space to connect before we move into the difficult stuff. We'll do a go around in a circle. Um, say your name and one ordinary thing that has brought you joy recently. So that we can remember we're human and that we have these complex lives and maybe even make connections over some similar things before we get down to the work of the meeting or the class. Another thing that dialogue does is recenter engagement. See that picture up there is of this sort of rhizome thing where there's no clear center um, so that people feel freer to engage directly with each other without always having to run to a leader. For students, this is revolutionary. My students have learned how to make a statement about something in class and then just turn to a classmate and say, so what do you think about that? I don't have to be the center. You know, I guide the content, we set up the structure, and then they can take it and they are so empowered because they know how to take it from there. I think this is, could be an amazing thing on a dialogic campus for staff, for faculty. It just allows leaders to hear better um, and to sort of lead from behind that kind of thing. And that it's expected in the culture that there's trust in the room that we can do it. It does, however, require facilitation. So a lot of the skills we teach um, when we're working on dialogic classrooms, dialogic campuses, and eventually dialogic communities, and actually I should be fair, Essential Partners mostly works in communities. Um, classroom works a little bit newer, uh, is teaching people how to facilitate this so it can happen. How do you hold those rules? How do you hold that space for people so that they can move into that space of trust and open communication, even when things are difficult? So I'm gonna now talk a little more about how to do this with some ideas that you might take away from this presentation and start thinking about. So the structuring for purpose, going back to the first one. If you're in a classroom, um, mention that you're doing a dialogic class on the syllabus, let people know when those full on dialogues are and, and mention where you're doing the other things, those connecting moments. Talk about it, forward it, and structure it so they can do it. Same thing in meeting agenda. Hey, we're gonna have a check in first and we're doing it for this reason. We need to align those structured dialogues or even those little dialogic moments with course content or the meeting purpose or the purpose of the reason you're together. It doesn't work as well, we're finding out when people are sort of guessing about why we might want to move them into these dialogic spaces. So being upfront about it and aligning it directly with purpose, that's kind of the secret sauce to make it happen. The other thing is like speaking in timed snippets where you're passing a timer around or inviting that reflection. These are tiered skills. Most of us do not normally communicate this way and we need to walk it up. So I do a gun dialogue with students in one of my classes. We are not doing that the first day. We're doing it towards the end of the semester when we have enough trust in the room so that people can speak openly. We start with smaller stuff, which is to say this is kind of a lot of work up front. It's a lot of work to build a dialogic space. But once we've done it, it's really efficient. 
and it builds itself when that culture starts being in place. So I want to leave you with a couple of ideas here. Um, to build these things up, you'll have to know what content is important to you. What do you want your participants to know or do? And what skills are they going to need to do it? So there's a lot of sort of backwards design. For those of you who are in that sort of pedagogical space, it's that backwards design element to it. The saying it out loud part. Yeah, you remember I said we need to voice values. We name and practice virtues and supporting skills. Curiosity, I tell people, is your superpower. But we need to practice being curious with each other. We need to practice listening. We need to practice open-mindedness. And something else we talk about is listening with resilience. How will you hear something that's hard for you? How can you continue to listen and not just shut down when somebody says the thing? So we give people practice with those skills. Uh, there's an app out there called Open Mind um, that I really love for students. It's put out by Heterodox Academy. And it walks, it sort of games them up. You love actually level up in the app um, about the virtues of being open-minded and why it's actually better for you, what it could lead to, as opposed to just shutting out anything that's different. We have some listening exercises. How is it you can listen to somebody, not just for that story, but for the values and emotions that are with the story, for what they're really trying to say, for example, if they're complaining, there's probably a hope behind that complaint. How can we hear that hope? And then real attention on how we speak and listen. How is it I can ask the curious question and not the rhetorical question? And sometimes we actually put people, we ask them to do both of those things so they can learn what it feels like to both ask and be asked those questions. And again, what is it like to listen well? How could I be that good listener for somebody else? Rules of the road. Right? So what you're looking at is a co-created elephant, um, I think by some kids, actually. You notice it's a little awkward. It's got some parts repeated. Right? But you can tell it's an elephant, and it's actually sort of charming when it's put together by committee. What we like to do when we make agreements is also put those agreements together by committee because that's when we're capturing what's important to people. And as a facilitator, then I need, I will know what I need to uphold in the space. So I wanna show you an example of some agreements that we put together in a classroom. Um, in this case, it comes from an exercise where we ask people, what would it take to dissent? You know, if you think you're the only person in the room who holds a dissenting opinion on the right side, what intentions will you hold for yourself? How do you have to think about your own intentions if you're gonna speak up and be heard. And you'll see there, and this action was geared at listening for this person, view all sides equally. Be comfortable with the idea that other people may not agree with me. Don't assume how people will understand me. Maybe I have to allow myself to be wrong. I don't have to get so worked up in being right all the time, such that I don't speak. Then going to the left, um, these are the agreements that came out. We thought about intentions. We also thought about some conditions in the room. Um, maybe it would be, I won't speak if I think I'm going to be stereotyped. I definitely won't speak if I think it's gonna show up on Instagram. So confidentiality is really important. I want people to listen intently to me. So this gets into the agreements part of this that we're going to set up. And that means giving eye contact and attention. Don't be on your phone when I'm telling you something really important. And this allowed us to craft these agreements that became the agreements we held in the room you know, for the rest of the semester. We respected others. We tried not to make it personal when it was inappropriate. Wanted to be open to minority opinion. And something really important about this, again, is this idea that you do not have to participate. We want to give people agency. So there's always a pass or pass for now. Uh, and that we will speak to be understood and listen to understand. So this is going to bring us to another important point. Um, when we're asking people to do this, we don't want to just compel them into it. We need a certain amount of buy-in. And reflection is a big part of that. Again, we often don't say the best thing we're going to say if we just spit it out. So we give people a couple of minutes, whether it's in those formal dialogue circles or even just in the middle of a class or before we start something in a meeting, take a couple of minutes and think. But here's some other things you can try. Try a dialogic moment, even if you're not going to have the full on conversation. Maybe you just take a moment and say, hey, take a couple minutes and think about and then give me some answers back in the classroom or be, again, when you're in the meeting. 
take a breath. Take a breath between speakers so we can reflect just a minute on what just happened before we move on. In classes especially, journaling, discussion posts. Some professors we've been working with use entrance and exit tickets. And so to get into the class, students show up with a piece of paper, either virtually or in person, where they have a question written down about something that happened the time before. And to get out of the class, you have to have a question about what just happened. We do quick check-ins and outs. How are you doing today? So we can kind of center ourselves in the room. And for the classroom stuff especially, Reflective questions aimed at what will you do with what we've learned in this class as you move along? Where do you want to use it? That reflection on vocation and a sense of who I am in that vocation. There's a lot of academic sort of pedagogy literature that really encourages that. And what I found for those of you who are on that pedagogy end or maybe the student life end of things, this is magic. It invites students, some of them for the first time, to really hook up what they're doing academically or in the student life world with who they want to be when they go forward. And I can imagine using this also for sort of faculty development and say, you know, early on with faculty or staff. What is it from this that you want to take you know, from whatever experience we just had? And how is it you want to use it in your work or professional life or your personal life? Then getting back to recentering engagement. Hmm. This is where communities get created. If you can have multilateral engagement, so if you're sort of dismantling or promoting structures so that people go directly to each other and not just always complaining up, you have a more robust community. In classrooms, this can create what I call a curiosity engine. So my students, you know, because we'd done some time dialogues, got very good at speaking in about 90 second snippets about whatever it was. And again, they just sort of turn to a classmate and say, and what do you think about that? Or they sent it off to the room. And they started doing it naturally to the point where they weren't just bouncing things off of me all the time, like a tennis match. It looked a lot more like a soccer game or something. I had an honors student who realized he'd always sat in the front row, had conversations with the professor in the room, and had never turned around to listen to his colleagues, his other classmates. Dialogic classrooms were the first time he'd done it, and he was really grateful for it because he learned a lot from the other people in the room. And he was sort of kicking himself for never having made that move before. And again, this can happen in all sorts of spaces instead of always going to a dean or a provost or chair, working together as a community that's invested with each other and that's tied to each other and understanding those ties. That for me is the place that this stuff is really, really, really fantastic. It encourages that kind of growth and discourages the top down straight up sort of maneuvering in the communities we work and live in. But these are facilitated spaces. So I want to go back to something I just said and really emphasize it here. One of the principles of this work is that every space promotes some things and prevents others. How is it we will create the spaces that promote the things that get to our purpose and will prevent some of the behaviors or things that happen that might get in the way of that purpose? So when thinking about facilitation, we want to think about creating spaces that align with that purpose. If I want one of those multilateral classrooms, how can students face each other, even in the most awkward of classrooms that I'm assigned to? How could I craft a faculty meeting where people can face each other and they're not just looking at me? Holding the space. Um, how could I intervene when agreements are broken? How can I gently and without shaming somebody say, hey, we had this agreement, we weren't going to interrupt. Can you just hold that thought for a minute until the other person is done speaking? This requires seating the center. For a lot of us, this feels risky and uncomfortable, but this again is how those strong communities are built. Part of facilitation means modeling those virtues. I can't facilitate and never listen to anyone. That is not modeling those virtues. Um, I want to try and be as open-minded as I can and model that open-mindedness. It also means being willing to change when necessary. If an agreement we've got or if some structure that we have is no longer supporting our purpose, we need to know that we need to change it. And we should probably check in with folks about that change. Again, the strong communities because we have strong relationships there. This is how this work unfolds. And what you may be noticing here is I'm not giving you really specific methods to do this. I'm encouraging you to have an outlook or an approach that's aligned with these principles. 
when folks do this well, and where I've seen it done really well on campuses and on communities, is when people make it theirs and hook it up with the culture of that campus or community. You're never going to do this well if you try to be somebody else when you do it. So I'd like to conclude with this. How can you be that unicorn? How can you take these dialogic skills out into the wild? Because just as those social issues are coming to us and to our campus, campus can come to our communities. This is really what I want with this. Uh, this is my dream. I want to tell you another quick story. Um, I was sitting having office hours in early December a few years ago. A student came up, tapped me on the shoulder. I thought we'd be talking about the final. And instead, she said the following, I really want to thank you. Thanksgiving was so much better this year. She had taken these approaches, had gone home to a family with whom she's polarized around something I don't even know, and had reconnected. What happens on our campuses can happen in our communities. It can start with us. Here are a few things you can start with you. Listen to understand and speak to be understood. Maybe back away from those rhetorical or persuasive responses if you can. Notice those structures around you. What do they prevent and what do they promote? How might you mess with those structures a little bit so they are preventing what you don't want to happen, what might be bad for your community? And how could you make them promote what you really want from that community? Value and practice open-mindedness and curiosity. Being the unicorn means being curious. It is absolutely your superpower. If you can lean into that curiosity and ask that one curious question across that social or political divide, that's how this starts. Community takes courage, courage takes competence, and competence takes practice. We've all been watching the Olympics lately. We have to practice this. Because the more we practice it, the more competent we get, and that's when we can go out on the floor courageously, crafting those brave enough spaces so that we can maintain those relationships. Or in the words of one of the co-executive directors of Essential Partners, be that positive deviation from the escalating norm. Be the unicorn. We can do it. Uh, I am so excited to work with all of you as we go along. Uh, and I'm going to show a slide now that has sort of contact information, both for me at SMU, uh, and for Essential Partners, they have a lot of great resources on their website. We hope you reach out to all of us. And we also hope um, you come to some programming that will happen at Dallas College. Before we get to that, um, a couple of inspirational things from st that my students have written to show you how to be the unicorn. So these came from a wrap-up question, one of those reflective questions that was actually um, co-created for me by one of our ethics professors here on campus, where we asked students, how do you want to be in the world based on things you have learned in this class? We asked them to sort of hook up the content and all of the dialogue stuff with this question about how you want to be in the world. I want to be someone who understands all sides of a problem before deciding what I think, and someone who is always open to new interpretations. This class helped me see a new way of doing that through non-combative discussion. I don't want to be known as someone who doesn't listen to the other side of an argument because this doesn't get anything done. This class taught me the value of listening, actually listening, to try and understand where other people are coming from. And one of my all-time favorites, I have not by any means become an eager political reformist who goes out to peddle their beliefs on the street corner but this class did teach me that dialogue between people that don't agree is possible. It can be civil, understanding, and productive. I used to joke that I was a passive anarchist waiting for civilization to crumble under the weight of Twitter and all of its friends. However, our dialogues and the outlook of the class give me hope for a world where I can listen and be heard by people who don't have the exact same political beliefs as me. After all, we can't get anything done if we're not listening to each other. Y'all, if 20 year olds uh, can be this articulate about it, we can be this articulate about it and we can move forward. So here are some opportunities at Dallas College um, in particular. So a group of staff and faculty have already been trained to facilitate dialogues on campus 
watch them go if you're around. I know some of you who are watching this aren't exactly on the Dallas College campus, but for those of you who are, check in, ask them what's going well. Um, the Sustainability Summit will be happening uh, and will feature some of this work. There are also planned workshops focusing on classroom instruction and student facilitation focused by, hosted by that same Office of Sustainability Outreach that'll be happening in the coming year. But most of all, I want to focus on this last one, and this is for all of you who might be tuning in. Those small, brave steps you take with what you've learned today, every day, just one, that curious question, listening with resilience, taking the breath. You can de-escalate it. You can learn something, and I promise you, your life will be enriched if you do. So thanks very much for listening. Here's some contact information for you. Again, my email's there at the top, um, and you can certainly hook up with Essential Partners. It's www.whatisessential.org. We'd love to hear from you, and we'd love to know how we can support you in doing this work. Thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. DeTemple. I hope you guys have enjoyed hearing her as much as I always do. Um, I've heard this presentation multiple times and every time I come away with some something new that I didn't hear the first time. So uh, please, if you can join us for the experience reflective structured dialogues session at 4 o'clock and now to close out the conference, we have Richard Johnson with Rice University who is one of the two co-chairs of the TRACS Executive Committee. And he's got some exciting news he's going to share with us. Well, thank you so much, uh, George Ann. I was just reflecting what a fantastic um, closing event that that was for a conference entitled Hope for the Future, right? I mean, you picked the, the exact um, right conversation to feature. Um, so, um, so I just wanted, first of all, extend um, my my heartfelt thanks and gratitude to our fantastic colleagues at Dallas College who put in so much time in making this event possible. Um, as I mentioned um, in the in the opening yesterday, Dallas College has been an enormously active member, not just of, of tracks, but of ACI as well, and has um, really made a uh, made a mark in the sustainability world. And um, and I, I see with all the good work that has been that is happening also in the city of Dallas, you know, I, I know that what you all have been doing has been uh, influencing beyond your borders. So uh, and very well done. Um, so if, if we can advance uh, the, to the next slide, um, you know, it, um, each institution that chooses to host a track summit puts forward many uh, hours of volunteer time. And we're grateful to all of them, starting in 2013 with UT Austin, uh, 2014, Texas A&M, 15 with Texas Tech. And then we were down at UT Rio Grande, Grande Valley for 2016, up to Texas A&M Commerce for 2017, over to Tarleton State in 2018. And we had many speakers from Tarleton State um, earlier and then uh, Houston Tillotson University 2019, and then now on our wall of honor, Dallas College 2021. Um, but uh, if we can uh, uh, click, you know, we left you with a bit of a cliffhanger. What's going to happen in 2022 and 2023? Well, before we advance to the next slide, I will say if there, uh, if there's anyone listening who has aspirations of maybe hosting in, in 2024, um, you can contact me at sustainability at rice.edu, or you can just reach out to, uh, to George Ann or to Brandon, and, and they will direct you accordingly. Now, let's go to the next slide and talk about what's going to happen in 2022. Normally, we have our track summits in the spring. COVID turned the world upside down. Um, so this spring, we're going to have what will probably be um, a half day spring virtual event, student focused and organized uh, by a group of student leaders from so far, we, we have um, half a dozen who have stepped forward from institutions around the state. Um, more will join in as well. And so uh, this will probably be in April ish of 2022. So um, 
I, and I like that it's taking us in a um, in a different direction and really putting students in a leadership position of deciding, you know, what kind of content is important for students, and they're going to uh, play a big role in 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 running this as well. So we're really looking forward to. Uh, to whatever it's going to be, although we're not 100% sure exactly what and when it's going to be yet. So uh, stay tuned for communications from our fantastic uh, communications committee of tracks. Now, in 2023, things get especially exciting. Um, uh, and if I can ask our IT team to, uh, to launch the video, please. Should have a little drum roll. Stay tuned. This is excellent. So assuming that it is safe to reconvene by then, uh, we're pleased to say that uh, we are already in planning station uh, stages with UT Rio Grande Valley to host the spring 2023 track summit down on the island. Um, and we are tentatively targeting February of 2023 before the spring breakers arrive. Um, they have hosted uh, at Rio Grande Valley at down in the island before. I can tell you it was fabulous. And uh, Brandon did some, some camping there as, as well. Um, we had a fantastic turnout from uh, Dallas College for that event. I know it was a bit of a, a drive, um, but uh, we would certainly look forward to seeing all of you down there again. Um, so, um, but at this point, uh, and right before I pass the mic back over to Georgianne, I want to in particular thank her support team um, who has been uh, so wonderful in, in working with us to make sure that um, that the the WebEx was running smoothly and uh, that the uh, PowerPoint uh, files had been properly shared. And and um, and when when my slides went sort of sideways yesterday morning, they were right there to rescue me. And so for the entire team that is supporting uh, Georgianne, I'm just grateful that you were there. Um, thank you so much. So at this point, microphone back to Georgianne. Uh, and, and I just wanna say uh, thank you, Richard, for the accolades. And there was a huge team of people even beyond the ones that you see on this session. And we had many, many uh, people from other colleges around Texas helping us put together this program. And there was supposed to be a thank you website uh, attached to the, the website where our agenda is. And it's gonna be up uh, also when we have the 
um, on-demand performances and presentations. And when we put back the live presentations, it'll take us about a week or two to get the live presentations um, updated to be ADA compliant, but we invite you back. If you have friends who had to miss it for some reason, direct them back to the website and that will be up until May 31st of next year. So thank you, thank you, thank you. We look forward to seeing you next spring at the student event and, um, and we hope to see you in the final session of the day, which starts in starts one minute ago. <laughs> it's experience reflective structured dialogues. Thank you for coming. Bye-bye.